If you need to reach the Institute for any reason, uh, info at pinky.org and the phone number is listed there, that 305 number, feel free to give them a holler and uh, we'll go from there. So tonight we're gonna visit about a few things. I wanna start by sharing with you a couple of things I did just this week. This is actually a case I did yesterday. Um, thus the tissues are still a little inflamed, et cetera. It's a kid that uh, had an accident and he, he busted out some front teeth and they're in the process of getting splinted back. I just did some composite. He's a 17 year old kid, I believe. And you know, it's so critical to understand the components of anterior teeth so that when we're doing some bonding like this, we have a really good feel for what should it be like. The things that, that really stood out to me were the mesial or distal width of the two centrals were really broad and the teeth that they just looked almost like they were paddle shaped. So I wanted to round the free gingival margin out a little bit more to get it a little more symmetrical. I wanted to narrow the interproximal a little. I wanted to get the appropriate height of the incisal edge. But my point is understanding these concepts are really important. One of the sayings I have is to quit telling people what they need and start showing them. This is another patient that we just recently saw just a couple of days ago here in the practice. This is Rosie. And Rosie presented because she wants longer teeth. And she's a beautiful young lady. And her lower teeth are in pretty good shape, but her uppers are not. So we're going to understand how we look at something like this, how we diagnose it and how to treat it. But at the end of the day, I start by looking at the width of these teeth. And that becomes one of the determinants as they determine how long should the tooth be. And then, of course, we've got to figure out where should the incisal edge go. So as all of this is, it's a wax up that we had done. From the wax up, I made a bisacryl stent. I put bisacryl inside of the stent, seated it in her mouth, and simply showed her what it could look like if we gave her something that's more proportionate. So I would tell you, um, if a great way to help patients understand what's going on instead of telling them is show them. So we get photographs before we begin. We get photographs with these in place. I let her wear those home, although I explained to her that they're not going to stay in very well because they're just kind of laying there on the teeth. But this has meaning to her. She can see it. And now she can understand what it would be like. So once again, understanding all of the contours and the components of how it should be really matters. Another gentleman that we treated last year, and I tell you, it's so, so disheartening when you see situations like this where we've got such biology issues, we've got structural issues, we've got, we've got aesthetic issues, but the reality is that while it looks really bad, that's how I perceive it, going through some of the same concepts of how we might wax something, how we might then make a stent to do some overlays, and then to eventually provisionalize him. Having the ability to understand these contours and what we can do then to allow appropriate healing, because we want to get gingival tissues and two shapes in these provisionals as right as it can possibly be before we ever, ever, ever go into the permanent restoration. So I would tell you that so much of what we have to do every day, it's choices we've got to make, and those choices affect so much how it's going to turn out. Just on a side note, I would tell you that I'm in the process of doing a near full mouth reconstruction on a beautiful lady. She's about my age. And I would tell you that I have done her provisionals on the upper anterior now three times. And the reason I have done that is I did my diagnostic wax up initially. I did her provisionals, really liked it. She came in and she said, what if those incisal ledgers are out facial just a little bit more? I thought, you know what? Let's look at it. So I did that. And she goes, I like that. And then I scratched my head and I said, well, what if we took them out even a little bit more? And we did that. And it turns out that that really helped. So my point is, don't get in a rush to get to the final restoration on these anterior teeth until you absolutely know in the provisional restorations what you want it to be like. Now, in my disclosure, I would tell you that um, I was trained as a lab tech. I'm in private practice. I've got my fingers and mouse all day long, just like you do. Um, I'm active at the Panky Institute. Um, I, you know, I need to take that off. I'm no longer involved at our dental school as of two weeks ago. 
Um, so I'm not doing that any longer. I will tell you that I think this part right here is really important to understand. Some of my dentistry sucks. It just does. Um, you know, I look at stuff I did a year or two ago and I scratch my head sometimes and say, what were you thinking? So I want you to know that's how it is. Um, but I'm just always trying to get it better. That's, that's the deal. Um, I do have some companies that help support me, not financially, but just in terms of some of the materials they provide and some of the information they give me. DMG is one of those. They've got a material called, Bis, uh, one of their Bisacryls called Luxacrown and Luxatemp that I use a lot. And so thanks to them, but, but they don't support me financially in any way. I've got to tell you, as we're talking about anterior teeth, oddly enough, I just, I got a text here just a little bit ago from this guy named Bill Robbins. And he says, hey, I'm going to Fling University and I break a leg. Bill is one of the dearest, most talented clinicians on the planet. And I would tell you, I cannot do a presentation on anterior teeth without talking about what he and Jeff Rouse put together in regards to dealing with the front teeth. We use this every day in our practice. I use it every day in my teaching. And I need to run through this with you because I think it's so critical as we start to understand the upper anterior teeth is what Dr. Robbins teaches us is this, that when we're in repose, we wanna do a measurement from glabella to the lower part of the nose and from the lower part of the nose to the chin, that should be about one to one. And in that, that measurement is typically done in repose. So not in a smile, not when they're looking like this, it's just a repose position. So that's one of the things that we look for. You can go to Harbor Freight and you can buy these dig digital calipers we actually had Dr. Robbins come speak at our study club. If you haven't heard him do this presentation, you need to have him, it's amazing. And as gifts for our study club, we, we got everybody these digital calipers. I think they're like 18 bucks at Harbor Freight. So here you see he's one-to-one -one and that's how it should be. You can then break it down a little bit more. When you look at the lower half of the face from the base of the nose to the upper lip, and then from the upper lip down to the bottom of the chin, that is about one thirds and two thirds. And so when we look at it, there's a few things about the upper lip that are important. First of all, in ladies, the upper lip is 20 to 22. Guys, it's a little bit more, 22 to 24. We'll see why all this is important in just a little bit. As we age, is what happens is the face grows out and down. And so as we get older, one of the things that occurs is we show less and less upper front tooth. So one of the things we can discuss with our patients is, hey, let me change that in size ledge position, show more tooth, and it's going to give you a more youthful smile. So we keep that in mind. So without question, we know that as we age, things change. Uh, we just tend to conceal more and more of the tooth, the face drops out and down. You can simply get a little ruler and measure. From the, from the nose down to the lip, there you see we're about 20 millimeters. As we age, that's gonna drop down. We're gonna show less and less of the upper front tooth. The other thing that Dr. Robinson Rouse teaches us is about lip mobility. When you go from a repose to a full smile, the lip should move up from that repose to a full smile somewhere between six to eight millimeters. So here you see, we've got somebody in repose and then they have a smile. And once again, you'll notice that for those people, lip length, 20 to 24, mobility should be about six to eight millimeters. <clears throat> okay. There we go. So <clears throat> one of the things that's so critical when we're evaluating aesthetics of the upper anterior is to understand where does the incisor edge go? And we all know this, it should be cradled by the lower lip and follow the contour of the lower lip. We also know that guys tend to show just a little bit less tooth than girls. So that's just kind of how it is. This is critical though, to look at free gingival margin height position. We know that from canine to canine, the central should be on about that line. The laterals are very close. They might be down just a little bit, but in general, we need to know that. Why is it important when we're looking at smiles and under, understanding interior aesthetics? Because we're gonna use some of these rules to help us understand how to make all of this more aesthetic. So one of the things we're gonna do in a little bit 
we're going to actually draw the upper anterior teeth. So if you don't have some paper handy and a pencil, I'm going to encourage you to do it. Don't get a little piece of paper, get a, a typewriter or typewriter, a piece of copy paper, something that large enough that we can draw on. But here's what's critical to understand. There's some ratios. The width of this central incisor is here. The width of the lateral should be about 75% the width of the central incisor. And there's a ratio of length to width. If we measure the width of the central incisor, the length of this tooth should be about 25% longer. So that's one of the most critical things that we start to look at as we go through our um, diagnostic workup. So at the Institute, one of the things that we uh, have integrated into our curriculum, I actually published this a number of years ago, it's the concept of what I call the global restorative sequence. And it's patterned from the global diagnosis that Dr. Robinson Rouse created. And so I begin with what I call a diagnostic footprint. And as all that means is, what do we do in the lab to work stuff up? I'm trying to figure it out in the lab. Once I've done it in the lab, then I've got to go into the clinic and use a sequence to put that in place. So here are the seven steps of that diagnostic footprint. We start with global diagnosis. We treat that as needed. We're going to take care of the joints and the airway. And then the next thing we've got to figure out is where does that upper incisal edge go? And so that becomes the challenge that we have. Then it's just a matter of paralleling the lower incisal edge to that, getting everything coupled, asking the question, do we need to change vertical dimension? And then I simply level the lower occlusal plane and then restore the upper occlusal plane to the lower. So that's the process that we use. Tonight, we're gonna to spend most of our time just dealing with the anterior segment. This is why I think some of the global diagnosis stuff and understanding tooth proportions is so critical. When I am in the lab trying to figure out where the incisal edge goes, I start by measuring the width of the maxillary central incisor. So get your calipers out and you measure it. Let's say that it's eight millimeters. Then I know the length of that tooth should be around 10 and a half millimeters. Now, the question is, if I'm going to give the tooth 10 and a half millimeters of length, does that mean I bring the incisal edge down, raise the gum line up, or a combination of those things? And that becomes the real challenge for us to understand. The point is though, that the tooth proportion is gonna be about that four to three ratio. And we start by measuring the width of the maxillary central incisor. So once I get the upper anterior incisal plane where I want it, then I simply level the lower occlusal plane to that in the anterior. Then I create an anterior to posterior occlusal plane that is level. And then I simply create the upper posterior to fit to the lower posterior. For those of you that have not taken E4 at the Institute, we have an entirely new curriculum that is dedicated to just this very thing. Understanding how to use global diagnosis, applying that in the anterior part of the mouth, and then restoring in sequence from there until you have the full mouth reconstruction. We go into vertical dimension, we go into all kinds of things, it's really worthwhile. So now I simply coordinate the upper posterior to the lower posterior, after we have that level plane of occlusion. So that's a little bit of the restorative footprint that we do in the lab. So I would tell you that in my practice, I spend a lot of time in my lab doing stuff, doing diagnostic wax ups. And this is the response that I get often from doctors when I say, are you gonna do your own diagnostic wax up? They go, you're out of your mind, Fling, I'm not gonna do it. Well, the reality is that for most dentists, it's probably not real practical. It's really not. So I was a lab tech. I enjoy waxing. I, I do it, you know, fairly quickly. Um, but there are some ways I'm going to teach you to cheat so that you can make it work more quickly for you and make it a little more advantageous. One of the courses that I teach is a waxing course. And you know the deal, wax on, wax off. Here's one of the things that you've got to understand if you're going to be a great waxer. You wax like you draw it. So if you were going to draw the maxillary central incisor, what's the first thing you're going to draw? 
the outline form. You're going to draw the perimeter, the periphery of the tooth. Then you're going to do all the other things to create the nuances and the contours and shapes and the anatomy, et cetera. If I ask you to wax the upper anterior tooth, you're going to have a really hard time doing that if you're not really clear on what the shape and form of that should be. So you've got to have that mental image in your mind because if you're going to wax it, you wax it like you draw it. And if you can't draw it, it's not typically because you're not a good artist. It's typically more because you may not have the concepts ingrained in your mind so well. So in our practice, if we're doing diagnostic workup, this is that footprint where we're trying to figure out what to do. We take two sets of diagnostic models. Um, we mount both of those with our face bow on our semi-adjustable articulator. And um, one set we leave alone. So now we have the before. It's on the other set that we go in and do our diagnostic wax up on. Now, having said that, the utilization of digital stuff for doing wax ups is coming on strong. And I would highly encourage you to uh, go to people that are teaching that because that's where it's going. Uh, one of the things I say is the wax spatula of a young laboratory technician today is a computer mouse. So there are different ways to skin this cat. At this point, I'm, I'm still doing most of my things in wax, although we're in the process of learning more and more digital stuff as we progress. So keeping that in mind, here's one of the ways you can cheat with waxing. If you don't have a nay rapid waxer, go get one. Um, you can order them from the Institute, you can get them online. Um, I think they're like, a hundred bucks or something. They're not very expensive at all. But at the end of the day is what I do is I use a uh, whip mix white presentation wax. It's just a great wax to do your diagnostic wax ups on. If you'll recall on the slide a few slides ago, I showed you the two sets of diagnostic models. We use a white plaster to pour them in and a white mounting stone. And then we use a white wax. And the other reason I do that is I want these to be pretty for our patients. So I want them to look at them and go, ooh, those look nice. Because the idea is, you know, Miss Smith, if I, if I spend that much time to make your study models look great, don't you think we're going to do that on your teeth? So it's just reinforcing how we want it to be. But this Nay Rapid Waxer will just really help you. Um, one of the things that I'll encourage you to do as you do wax ups like this is to use it. Because look at the posterior teeth back here. I did not take hours and hours waxing these up like we did in dental school. Notice the plaster is cut down to right there. Can you see that? I've just got that much plaster. Is all I've done is I've gotten the Nay Rapid Waxer teeth. I've set them in place here. I've put a little wax around the axial surface and literally in minutes, I can wax that whole quadrant right there with back teeth. I just get the plaster out of the way. So there are ways to cheat. So that's our Nay Rapid Waxer that we use. And then we just keep an inventory of these teeth. We've got them in the thing back there and they're, they're numbered or named. And you just grab one of the teeth and you cut the plaster down and you put it in place and, and off you go. So keeping that in mind, we also have got ways to cheat in the anterior part of the mouth. These are silicone pieces that we can put wax in to wax the anterior teeth. Um, again, Smile Line USA is where I get them. They've got them in like three different sizes and contours. They have them for the upper and the lower anterior teeth. So if you want a great way to cheat, there it is. So keep that in mind. I want to share with you one other thing. I've got three different types of electric waxers in there in my lab. And <clears throat> I would tell you that this is my absolute favorite waxer. Um, it's a waxer from Whitmix. Now, this is a one-pin waxer. They have a two-pin waxer that I like even better because I can be using it, and then my partner, Dr. Cord, can be using it at the same time. So we're not having to fight over pins. The thing is, with these waxers, I set it at around 200 to 215 degrees. I like mine a little bit hotter. Be sure you're doing it in Fahrenheit, not centigrade. These waxers are not expensive. If you want to deal on one, that phone number up there, that 848 number, call that number, ask for Kinsey, 
and she'll get you lined up on getting one of these waxers. Now, I want you to hear this. I make absolutely zero dollars from having you buy these. The only reason I promote this waxer is because it's the one I use and I like it. That's it. So I don't get a kickback on this at all, but they do offer some special pricing through the Institute and through, through the seminar stuff that I do. If I do a waxing course with a study club or something, they are kind enough to provide those for me when we do that waxing course. So keep that in mind. One of the rules of waxing is this. If you're going to wax a whole tooth on a model, get the excess plaster out of the way. You just don't want it in your way. I would rather over reduce the plaster because if you're trimming the wax, it has some softness to it. You get to the plaster, it's hard. And now it's in the way and you're having to cut it and you get your scalpel and you cut your fingers off and it's just no bueno. So once I get the plaster out of the way, I just get a little dot of rope wax and I put on top of that where I've cut it back and then I set the tooth on that rope wax. And then I add the white presentation racks around the perimeter and, uh, and then we simply set the uh, wax to axial surface that way. So that's just some quick tips about waxing. Now then, as we look at the diagnostic footprint, that's our diagnostic wax up that we do. We've also had to go into the clinic and we've got to do some of this stuff. So these are the seven steps in the clinic that we do. Once again, we've completed our, di our global diagnosis and we've treated that however it might be. We've dealt with the joints, so maybe they've had splint therapy, maybe they've been equilibrated, whatever it might be. If they had airway issues, we're doing that. If I'm altering vertical dimension, we deal with that first by doing some premolar stops to establish vertically where we want to be, but then we start by getting the upper incisal edge where we want it to be. And after we've done that, we parallel the lower incisal plane to it, then the lower occlusal plane is created symmetrical and parallel, and then the upper back to that. Once again, if, if you want more about that, go to the Institute, go through the e, new E4, we go through all that in detail. But I want to give you just a few quick clinical tips that I think can help you if you're playing with incisal edge position or length. This is a lady that's been in my practice for many years. Her granddaughter is getting married and she wanted her incisal edges a little bit longer. She just didn't like them. Well, she's going to be seeing the periodontist for grafting, obviously, and there's a lot going on. So I'm just trying to get her fixed up for the, for the uh, wedding. So I just did what we used to do in the lab. Here you see I've done a little bit of wax up. I made a stent out of Siltec. I've gone in with the scalpel, and I very carefully cut through the inner proximal one, two, and three. And with it cut through the interproximal, here you see I put mylar strips through there. Now I put the index in place and the mylar strips, you can see one, two, and three have gone through to separate the interproximals. So now you do the things you do. You do your etch, you do your bond, you throw on whatever composite floats your boat and you start to to contour and shape and polish and you get your front teeth done. For me, that just makes a lot of sense. It makes this process a whole lot quicker. What about a scenario like this? This was a patient of mine. She moved out to California and um, she was a flight attendant for Southwest Airlines. And while she was out there, she lost um, a couple of front teeth and they did a bridge. And she came back and she said, Dr. Fling, I don't like it. What can we do? I said, well, I'm not sure. So I sent her over to Dr. Brian, oral surgeon. He took a look at her. And obviously, we have got a huge, huge bony defect here. I'm speculating that's what? Probably, what, maybe 8, 10 millimeters? It's something pretty significant, right? So we did a multitude of surgeries. She literally had five different surgeries. She had bone grafts. We, we did incense and we danced around and we did everything you could possibly do to try to create bone. And this is what we came up with. This is the best we could do. So notice we were able to start the development of some papilla. He uh, put some fixtures in. And this was me starting to, to play with that. And then we transitioned eventually into permanent crowns. And this is what we came up with. 
Now, that looks pretty good, but here's the key to making all this look great. The key is when you get the photograph, this final photograph, you make sure that she gets some spit so she can get a spit bubble right there in the black hole that you might see just to hide that. So anyway, that's where she was. Here she is a year later, and here she is two years later. And she said, Dr. Fling, I just don't like it. What can we do? And her name's Teresa. I said, well, Teresa, I don't know. So I got with Dr. Brian. He said, Mike, we got a punt, brother. He said, I've got no blood supply. Uh, there's, just, there's just not a great way to do this. So the good news is that this implant retained crown here and here, they were screw retained. So I was able to get those off and unscrewed them. And it's what I've used here. This is pink composite. And this stuff can save your cookies in the anterior part of the mouth sometimes. So here you see, I've just etched, I'm bonding the pink composite. It comes in all kinds of colors. You can get it in flowable and packable. It, can, it comes in like a deep purple, a light pink. So you can mix everything to really match quite well. And so I play with that at the chair. I use some sable brushes to help sculpt that into place. Here you see my mylar right here, right? So I put that in place. Then I started to do the lateral that you see here. And when we were finished, that's what I had. So, you know, that was a great way to, to just kind of make something better out of a not great situation. Um, there's the product, it's from an accident. Um, that's the kit that, that I have and, and it, it's fun to play with. Now, I'm gonna show you a little bit later at the very end of our presentation today, a, an alternative to composite. Now keep in mind that this is not under any load, right? So as she functions on this, this composite's just really not getting stressed. So it holds up really well. Um, but you know the deal, sometimes bonding to, to porcelain or to lithium disilicate or any of those things can be a challenge without question. But the point is that it's not under a functional load. So it tends to hold up pretty well. Um, so that's what we did. Now then, as we look at these incisal planes, one of the things I mentioned here is I want them parallel. And I wanna share with you a couple of things. This is a lady that was diagnosed through global diagnosis. She had three things going on. She had dental alveolar extrusion. It's all that means is that as teeth wear, the tooth erupts in compensation to the wear and the free gingival margin follows it. So I can get uneven free gingival margin height. She also had vertical maxillary excess and she has a hypermobile lip. So she said, Mike, you can fix two out of three of them, but we're not doing that surgery thing. So I said, all right, one of the keys when we're evaluating incisal edges, when we're evaluating occlusal incisal planes, I always do that while the patient is standing up. It's critical because if you're doing it while they're in the dental chair looking down at them, the angulation is gonna change. The teeth will appear longer than they really are. So you do that on somebody that's 6'2", and then have them stand up and look down at you. Now, all of a sudden, you get a reverse smile line, and the perception is completely different. The other thing is head posture can change. When that head posture changes, the interproximal cant can change. So I'm always viewing the incisal plane while the patient is standing up. In this circumstance, we overtreated her with orthodontic intrusion. We purposefully did this, knowing that she had a gummy smile. Remember what I said, we start by measuring the width of the tooth and the length of it should be about 25% longer. Well, I couldn't just blindly make her incised ledge longer pre-intrusion because the overbite would have been such, she would have broken the teeth. So we've intruded her now with this, with this being short, I can add length back give me a better proportion tooth, and it's going to hold up because it's not in the way of her parafunction. So in this case, I simply had the orthodontist take the wire off. I took a quick alginate impression. I waxed this up after that. I made a stent that evening. From my stent, I made a composite shell. This is hollow in the middle. I fill that with packable composite, and we seat it in the mouth. The appointment for me to seat and polish these took one hour. 
If I'm doing that by hand, it takes forever. But if I can do a wax up, make a stent, create a thin shell, fill the shell with packable composite, get it in place, cure it, put flowable composites around the margin to seal them and polish it, these can happen very, very quickly. Now, the downside to this case was we got her to this point. She ended up getting debanded. And when we were finished, she said, Dr. Fling, um, do we still have to do veneers? I think that looks pretty good. And I said, yeah, I don't, we don't really need to do veneers. The composite has held in there really well and uh, it worked really good. So in my last webinar that I did a few months ago for the Institute, we actually did it on this composite overlay technique. If you want more information on that, that number for Kinsey that I gave you earlier, call that. Um, I actually had an article published on it. I'll be happy to have her forward that to you. And it goes through all the steps in the process of doing that very thing. Here's another example of that. This is a lady that um, comes in as a new patient. Obviously, she's got a lot going on. Um, we're referring her to the orthodontist. We're referring her to the periodontist. Um, but I got to get her ready for those things. So we got to get some of the decay out, get her stabilized before she goes and has her ortho and before she has her periosurgery. So in this circumstance, I did my diagnostic wax up. Here you see my, my stent that I made from my wax up. And this is a composite shell. I put flowable composite inside of here and I make a thin shell out of flowable composite. I trim this until I can passively get it to go into place where I want it to go. And that's the critical part. You have to trim these so that they passively go to place. Then you etch, you prime, you bond, you get packable composite inside of it, you seed it, you position it, you get rid of the excess, you cure it, polish it, and off you go. I use this same technique on posterior teeth. This is on the same lady. I get all the decay out. She's going through ortho. Typically, I would have put in a composite core filling. I would have prepped it and put a temporary crown on. Well, I said to myself, why do that? Instead, this is flowable composite that I put inside my Nay Rapid Waxer. I create my occlusal contour from that. I trim it until it passively fits on here. I etch, I prime, I bond. I fill this with packable composite. I seat it in place. Let me go back one more, sorry. I seat it in place, and this is a full composite core that we did. So I did that on this tooth here. I did it on this tooth here. We did the lingual cusp here, and we just used that technique. So I did that on her anterior teeth too. So this was the composite shell that I put here. This is all composite here. And then the back molars, as I showed you just a little bit ago. So now she's stable without temporary crowns. So as the orthodontist does his thing, I don't have to worry about those provisional crowns coming off. I don't have to worry about marginal leakage. She's in ortho now. She's seen the periodontist for grafting stuff here and off we go. So it's just a great technique to help us provisionalize. Now let's get to the meat of what I wanted to talk to about tonight, because remember what I said, we want the incised ledge to cradle the lower lip. And as we do our diagnostic wax up, I want us to understand that our intuition about what seems right about upper anterior teeth it can be a very emotional thing. And what might look aesthetic to you may not look aesthetic to me. It's a very individual thing. And it doesn't make anybody right or wrong. It's just we all have a different perception of what that should be. Now, many of you that have heard me speak before understand I'm not terribly uh, politically correct. So um, I want you to understand that when you look at this word emotional, I want you to see how different it feels when it's just like that. It's the same word, but the perception of the word changes because it looks different. And that holds true with anterior teeth. We're going to look at Ken. I did this case, my goodness gracious, it's been 15, 20 years ago. The materials that I would use today, completely different. I would tell you that based upon what I know today, this would be an ortho case without question. But back then, I didn't necessarily have the conviction that I do now. And I opted to treat this restoratively. 
Now, I want you to notice a few things about him. Look what he's got cooking right here. Here's his canine, and it's in the spot of the lateral incisor. But obviously, if I'm going to make this a lateral incisor, that's going to be one big tooth. And over here, I'm missing a lateral incisor. And of course, the space that we have here is very narrow. So I've got to find a way to make all of this fit. And it's what I'm going to tell you is the reality of what we have can be very different than the perception of what we think is there. And we're going to use some of those thoughts to help us as we treatment plan and get him taken care of. So remember what I said, it's a perception. I also said that I'm not politically correct. So I can't hear any of you, but I know you're muted, but you got to laugh at that. I mean, that's got to be kind of funny anyway, right? So uh, uh, Dr. Baggett, if you're on here, thank you for, for giving me that slide. I want to throw you under the bus on that. So anyway, perceptions. What I said, it can feel one way or it can feel another way based upon how we see it. Now, here's the thing about upper anterior teeth. We can take some components and understand just how analytical we can evaluate teeth. And that's what we're going to do right now. So is what I want you to do for me is I want you to get out a large piece of paper and we are going together draw the upper six anterior teeth. And as we draw these, I want you to keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, I want you to be sure that as you draw these teeth, you draw them large. Said another way, I want the central incisor to be maybe, oh, what? A couple of inches wide by maybe, you know, proportionally, however that works out in terms of length, what, three inches or so long? Make them large enough that you can understand some of the nuances of how we want these teeth to be. So keeping that in mind, I want us to start by drawing the two central incisors. And as you draw them, I want you to understand a few very important things about them. First of all, with the central incisors, there is a frame and the frame looks kind of like this, is what you've got is a height of contour right here. And that height of contour should slightly be offset to the distal is what happens too often with crowns or with wax ups that we see is we get this in the center of the tooth and from here to here is completely symmetrical. And when that gets completely symmetrical, it immediately looks fake. So this outline form should be such that this zenith or this height of contour should slightly be offset to the distal. So draw your two frames of your two centrals similar to that real quickly for me. Okay. Now, a couple of things. The distal incisal angle is more rounded than the mesial. We know that because we know that as we go more distal, incisal embrasures tend to open up more. So we're sharper on the mesial. We're more rounded on the distal. And remember what I said about the length to width ratio. We always start by measuring the width. The length should be about 25% longer. So once again, when we're doing a diagnostic workup, measure the width of the central, the length should be 25% longer, but now you got to figure out where does the incisal ledge go? In other words, the incisal ledge position might be fine. Maybe the gum has to go up 25%. Well, how do we do that? We do it either through intrusion or through crown lengthening. So those are the considerations that we have to have. So there's our ratio of three to four. Now then, how do we create the personality of the tooth? And this is it with contour lines or contour ridges. A contour ridge is the intersection between the facial and the interproximal part of the tooth. It's this ridge right here and right there. It's called a contour line or a, con a contour ridge. On central incisors, here's the deal. I have a mesial and a distal contour ridge, and there is a central contour ridge. And between the central and the mesial contour ridge, and between the central and the distal contour ridge, there is a depression right here. This depression is broader at the incisal. It gets narrower as we go gingivally. It is deeper at the incisal. It gets more shallow as we go gingivally. And here's the most critical part of it. 
I want you to absolutely write this on your forehead. It is highly irregular and highly subtle. Okay, it's a little bitty subtle irregular thing. The best way to learn it is in the lab. Literally today with my partner, Dr. Cord, we were doing lower anterior provisional restorations and I was demonstrating how to create these depressions on lower anterior teeth because they're, they're there also. So it's a very subtle, very irregular thing. The best way to view contour ridges is looking down the incisal edge. So as I look down this incisal edge, I want you to look at these two central incisors. And perceptively, one of those two teeth appears to be broader. And I think we could all agree that if I'm looking down the incisal edge, here's the cingulum, this tooth appears to be broader here than it does here. But the reality is the width of both of these teeth are exactly the same. The only difference is the contour ridges are out wider here, they're narrower here, which makes this tooth perceptively look smaller than it really is. So here in these restorations, you'll notice we've got pretty prominent mesial and distal contour ridges. Here's our central contour ridge. You can see the light reflecting off the depression right here and here. That's what gives our teeth a little bit of oompa and makes them look real. Now, here's what I want you to look at. Look at the two central incisors. That's all, nothing's gonna change on the next view except for the two central incisors. We have this, we have this. Notice that the two centrals appear to be narrower. They're exactly the same width, but they don't look the same because we've rolled the contour ridge in, making them look narrower. And here you see we've done it even more. So while all of those teeth have exactly the same width, they feel differently because we have changed the contour ridge position, which in turn changed the perception of what we see. So we're gonna use that to our advantage. In this case, as I start to make these provisions, there are those depressions. They're really subtle, they're really minor. If you look here, you can see it right there. You can see it right there. You can see it right there, it's very subtle. Now, when we go to the laterals, they're just like the centrals and only they're slightly different. A few things about the lateral incisors. First of all, the outline form is very similar. You're gonna have a zenith or height of contour that is going to be a little more accentuated more to the distal due to the tooth being on an arch form and slightly rotated. So this may appear to be even slightly more distal. The other thing is the incisal edge will be up a little and the free gingival margin might be down just a little. And then remember, we've got to go back to our proportions. Back in the day, we used to teach the golden rule of proportion from the central to the lateral of the canine. And as all that meant is you took a ratio that felt about right. So if you looked at all of these boxes, I would ask you which one feels right? There's not a right or wrong answer, but most people would say that dimensionally, C tends to be about right. Well, that's a ratio of about one to 1 1.6. Um, photocopy paper, business cards, so many things that we use every day have about that dimension because it feels about right. So if I got that and I moved that into my central position, the idea was that the lateral should be in a ratio there of about 1.6 to one, and then the canine should be about one to 0.6. We see go to proportion in human, in, the, in our body. We see it in nature. You see it in architecture. This was a picture of me just a few short years ago, back when I had hair. Um, I, I know I look good, you gotta admit it. Um, the reality is, have you ever seen a guy walking down the street like this and you see his tie up, you know, like halfway up his shirt and it just doesn't look right? Well, you know now the reason is because it's not in golden proportion. It's just something that perceptively feels right. It's got to do just like that. It's called fall right at the belt or it's just not right. So the reality is front teeth are not in golden proportion. That's only a guideline. We have an actual view. The actual view would be the front teeth laid out on a flat plane. But guess what? The front teeth are not on a flat plane. They're on an arch form. 
So with that in mind, keep in mind that we are looking at a perceived view. We're looking at a view of the teeth as we go around an arch form, and that gives us some latitude to change some things. When we do the laterals, is what you should know is that the laterals are the most irregular anterior teeth. They are more irregular than any other front tooth. So when you're doing a left and right lateral restoration, don't make them look like twins. Make them look like cousins, okay? So they can be similar, but don't make them exact. The incisal edge of maxillary lateral incisors are really, really varied. And if you look at this photo, look how rounded this one is. This one is flatter here, and it's got this little thing going on, and then to here. But the point is that incisal edges on lateral incisors are often very, very different. So I'm okay with golden proportions as a guide, but don't take it literal. It's sometimes the little nuances when things aren't exactly the same that make it look more natural. A couple of things about the laterals so that'll help us. First of all, as we go back, I've already mentioned the zenith and the height, the contour, the distal incisal edge gets even more rounded. The mesial incisal edge is slightly more rounded than the central. I mentioned the gum and the incisal edge length, keeping in mind that we're on a curvature. But the other consideration that will really make a difference is this right here. You've got your contour ridges, mesial and distal. Remember the tooth is rotated. The mesial depression will tend to be a little more dominant than the distal depression. But here's another part that can really, really help us, and it's this. On the gingival area of the mesial right there, this right here, there's a mesial S shape. Is what we see all too often is contours where this comes out and it's rounded and fills to here. It gets real oval right here. And when you do that, I, I call it a butter bean. It immediately looks fake. So you've got to think about giving this a little bit of artistic flair in what I call a mesial S shape right there. It's a very subtle thing right there, okay? So we've got that. Proximal contacts as we go distal get more narrow because incisal embrasures get bigger as we go more distal. So that makes sense. Now the canines, these are the tough ones. Ask any dental technician and they will tell you that the canines are about the hardest tooth there is to, to really create a great contour. When you look at canines, here's what you need to know. There's a mesial contour ridge, a central contour ridge, except that the central contour ridge is not in the center of the tooth it is slightly offset to the mesial. The depression between these two ridges right there, that is the largest, most dominant um, uh, recessed area in the anterior part of the mouth. This can be really, really well defined. So here's the deal. You can start by looking at the buccal plate of bone up here. And when you have that, the emergence profile, as it comes out of the tooth, can parallel that, and then it should either go down or lingual. Too often, we'll see long axis of teeth come out this direction here, and they shouldn't do that. We want the long axis to either go down or slightly lingual. Not only is there an S shape on the gingival here, it's much longer than this on the lateral there. So here you've got it, but you have an S shape on the incisal. I will guarantee you, if I'm doing a diagnostic wax up with you, I will guarantee you I'm gonna open up this incisal embrasure more than what you have. This incisal embrasure is often so open that if the patient opens the mouth, you can actually see the lingual cusp of the upper first premolar sometimes. So opening this embrasure with an S shape can really be helpful. Now, here's the deal. When you view a canine, remember what I said, you've got a mesial contour ridge, a central contour ridge that is not in the center of the tooth, it's offset slightly to the mesial, and a distal contour ridge here. When viewing this tooth from the facial, from the perceived view, you should see very little to none of the tooth distal 
to the central contour ridge? That's a test question. So I'm going to repeat it. A mesial, a distal contour ridge, a central contour ridge is not in the center. It's slightly offset to the mesial. When viewing the tooth from the facial, you should see very little to none of the tooth distal to the central contour ridge. You may see a little of it, but not a lot. And this is the broadest part of the tooth. So you'll see little to none of it. This, you'll see a lot of it. That depression right there could be more predominant. Look at the depression here on the lateral. There's a central contour ridge, there's the mesial. Here's our little bit of depression, okay? So keeping that in mind, long axis of teeth, they should all point to slightly below the belly button. Don't get these canines to where they're coming straight down or out facial. These long axis should point slightly inward. So here's a summary. Our free gingival margins are on about the same plane. The laterals can be down just a little. Incised ledge is on about the same plane. The incised ledge of the lateral could be up just a little. We have highly irregular incised ledges on the lateral. I have an S shape here. I have an S shape here, and I have one here. Interproximal embrasures here take up about 50% of the overall tooth length. On the lateral, it's about 40, and on the canine, it's about 30 because Incisal embrasures tend to open more as we go more distal. So keeping those thoughts in mind, let's go back to Ken. So if I'm gonna complete a diagnostic wax up on him, what do I want to do? I wanna make this tooth, it's gonna to be too big. So one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna move the midline over. So here I do my diagnostic wax up. I'm moving my midline over to close some of this space, and I'm gonna move my contour ridges in to make these teeth appear narrower. I'm gonna move my contour ridges out over here to make these teeth appear broader. Now, I would tell you that back when I did this case, I applied all those things that we've just talked about. Here you see my prep guide from my diagnostic wax up. I'm gonna over reduce here, I'm gonna under reduce here, and I'm gonna do all the things you would do with preparations, et cetera. I equilibrated the lower anterior. We elected to take off the two crowns. I get those in place. Back in the day, I would, I just, Dr. Schillingberg, who was my boss at the school, he would have killed me if I evaded this out over this tissue. Today, I wouldn't think twice about that. Back then, we just didn't do that. So I didn't like the contours of this, but I didn't want to infringe upon that tissue. So with that in mind, here he is provisionalized. And here he is in his final restorations. Now, again, these are porcelain fused to metal. These were done forever ago. But I want you to look at the difference in the contour ridges. Look how rolled in these are here. Here, to make this appear narrower, look how broadened the contour ridges are here to make those look broader. And so it's not the reality of what's there. It's the perception of what is there. Because I've got to tell you, when I first started that case, I didn't think I could do it restoratively. But when I went through my footprint, got it waxed up and understanding contour ridges, I learned, well, you know what? I can cheat a little. I get it. We don't have much space there, but we can cheat. And in doing that, we're able to get that type of outcome. So from back when I did that case today, there's no doubt materials have changed. And you all know the deal. Um, with today's uh, materials, Preparation designs are still critical, and I would tell you that this is one of our biggest issues right here. Um, I will venture to guess, I know at OU College of Dentistry, the majority of the preparations that I see are under-reduced. And with Emacs, with zirconia, we've got to have adequate reduction. Now, without question, there are some changes going on with some of the materials today. I still think it's critical that we do a preparation design. I do a heavy chamfer, a heavy chamfer, or a shoulder 360 degrees around a tooth. Once again, um, myself, I published an article years ago that I that Kenzie could forward to you about this preparation design. I'd be happy to forward that to you if you want it. But for most of the materials that we work with today, these are minimum reduction amounts. We've got to give them the appropriate space. I used a round in uh, tapered diamond to do my axial reduction following the free gingival margin height. It's critical that we do not sever this interproximal tissue right here. 
there are transeptal fibers that go from the center proximal around to mid facial. If I go in and I sever those, I can then contribute to mid facial recession. So I've got to have a preparation design that is going to honor that. So here's a scenario where we've got some bonding. Here you see our preparations. Once again, as we go to the interproximal right in there, I don't want to infringe upon that tissue. I want to preserve that at all costs. We're going to provisionalize and then we're going to go to tran transition into permanent restorations. And that's what we want to do to preserve that tissue as best as we possibly can. So that's just a little bit about prep design that I think is really important is to understand that we still have to have adequate reduction. Um, I would tell you, I have no problems with zirconia. Um, if you think about, <laughs> I, I remember years ago um, when I was learning at, at our dental school, we were doing porcelain fused to metal crowns and we were doing metal occlusals. And they said, well, you don't want the porcelain to rub against each other because it's abrasive and it'll wear. Well, one of the facts is when you look at zirconia as it ages, it tends to become very, very abrasive. So we know that. We know it's very strong material, but it's this damage accumulation that could occur. Well, there's a pretty easy answer for it. And the answer is highly polish it. So go to Brassler or go to Comet, and they both have great porcelain polishing kits. There's three steps you usually go through and just hit them with that. And you get rid of that, that roughness that the zirconia might have. But let's say that you don't. Let's say that we've done this and golly, I'm worried it's gonna be abrasive and it's gonna break things down. I contend there are times that that might be the best thing to use. As an example, what if I've got somebody who's got a derangement in the joint, I cannot put them in centric relation because if the condyle loads in the fossa and puts too much force, they're painful. I might want a restoration that's strong enough to keep the joint unloaded. I might want zirconia there. Well, then what about as we go on lateral excursions? If it's too abrasive, it can break things down. Well, the answer is, if I've got ideal occlusion, if I have flat centric stops, and if I have disclusion of the material in lateral excursions, I don't really care what it's made out of. Does that make sense? because now it's getting loaded compressively, zirconia, lithium disilicate, porcelain fused to metal, gold, all those are gonna hold up great. It's the lateral stresses on them that doesn't do so well. So keeping that in mind, just understand that if I'm concerned about some of the abrasiveness with zirconia, if you've got ideal occlusion with disclusion and lateral excursions, you very well may be okay. Now, I do a lot of lithium disilicate. I like Emax. It's strong. I think it works great. The downside to it is that it doesn't mask underlying colors as well as zirconia. But if I'm going to do something where I'm veneered or where I'm going to be bonded in place, this is the stuff I want to use. Um, a tip for polishing. If you do occlusal adjustments on lithium disilicate, <coughs> one of the cheats for polishing it, get a nice carbide burr like a football shaped carbide burr. It is wonderful for polish, polishing occlusal adjustment areas on lithium disilicate. It makes it shine, it gets it smooth, it works really, really good. So um, I, I use both of these in my practice. Now, if I'm gonna be bonding something, obviously I'm gonna be going to Emacs. Although there are some thoughts on the horizon that we might get to a point where we can actually bond uh, some of the zirconia, but that's still out there to be seen. Here's a case, though, where at the dental school, this patient would have been scheduled for a full coverage crown with a post and core. It's endodontically treated here. It's endodontically treated here. And that's what we do. Well, let's think about this. If I'm going to prep this tooth for a crown, and I've got this large access into the endo area here, by the time I do my tooth reduction for the crown, and I've got all of this access to the root canal, structurally, I don't have much tooth left. So let's think out of the box just a little bit. Instead, let's do a veneer type prep on the facial. Let's carry that over the incisal into the access where the root canal was. Now I'm gonna do a bonded restoration into this. We've gotta go through thoughts of minimum thickness of material, okay? So you can't do this half a millimeter thick right here. But I've got at least 1.2 millimeters thick, ideally 1.5 as I go down, 
Now these are bonded in place. I have no post. I have no core. I don't have to worry about structurally weakening that tooth. Um, is what the Monnier studies show is the key is preserving the, dis the lingual marginal ridge right here and here. If I can preserve that, that's where I gain my strength. Now I got a bonded restoration. I didn't have to do a post and core filling. So that's what we did. And then, and then off we go. So it's a very different type of preparation and is what's gonna happen. I see it happen all the time because I would do this with my residents and they would under reduce this right here. It's always under reduced. So you've got to get your minimum thickness of material right in there. So here she is. A um, couple of things here before we end. I know we started a few minutes late, and I apologize, so we'll end a couple of minutes late. And then after I give our ending code, I'm happy to stay and answer questions uh, if people have questions. I want to tell you that I'm always trying to think out of the box. This is a lady. She happens to be my neighbor that lives behind us, sweet lady. She's got a lot going on with breakdown. We ended up doing reconstruction on her. She would have been an ortho case, but she's in her 80s and got some health issues and she just didn't want to do it. But one of the things that concerned her was this tooth right here. She didn't like how short it looked. And so when I restored her, these are her final restorations and notice it, it looks okay now. How did I do that? That tooth is still lingualized. I got to thinking to myself, I said, okay, why is it that if I put an implant in on somebody and say I had to have an implant that was narrower than the dimension of the tooth. Um, why is it that I'm okay doing a ridge lap of porcelain over that ridge of tissue on an implant? So I just thought to myself, all right, why don't I do that on a tooth? So that's exactly what I've done right there. That is a tooth. It's lingualized. I actually have a ponic form that goes over the tissue into this area here to make it appear that it is the appropriate length. Now, in all honesty, I, I've got this thing temporarily cemented. She's had these crowns on for about four years. She lives behind me, so I get to see her often. And I've never done anything like that. I've done it several times since then. It's my first time to do it. I've taken it off and everything under there looks just great. She can get floss up under there and do her thing and it's done really well. So in just thinking out of the box on some of these front teeth in terms of what can we do. I want to close with one thing. I'm running up to Grand Rapids, Michigan um, next Thursday, and I'm doing a hands-on course there. And Dylan, I have no idea if there's any openings. I'm doing the same course in North Carolina the first weekend of December. And as what we're doing in our hands-on is the composite overlay technique for making some of these composite overlays. But also we're going to do a hands-on thing with this stuff called Mio. If you want more information on this, holler at me. Again, I've got zero financial interest in it. I promote this because I use it and I like it. Is what you see down here, this is a solid zirconia all on four. This is that same solid zirconia all on four, but it has been stained with Mio tooth colored and Mio pink. And as what Mio is, it's not a stain, it's a colored porcelain and it works on lithium disilicate. It works on zirconia. It works on porcelain fused to metal. It's low fusing, it fires at like 760 degrees. So it's low fusing. The cool thing about it is you can increase or decrease value, which you cannot do with stains. You can, you can use, they have stuff where you can change texture. So here you see is the zirconia restoration. Here you see Mio with it wet, and this is it after it's fired. The beauty of Mio is whatever you put on the tooth wet, that is exactly the color that you get after you fire it. And it's just not, it just doesn't happen that way with conventional stains. So I use this not every day in my practice, but at least every week. It's just great stuff to have around. All of these restorations here, these are uh, monolithic zirconia crowns. Nothing on there is layered. And that's the kind of effect you can get with this stuff. It is really cool stuff. Um, Mio structure is stuff you can use to alter texture that you see here. But here's why everybody needs this in your practice. So have you ever gotten your crown back and you seed it and you adjust it and now you put it in and you've opened it in proximal contact? Or am I the only one that's happened to? Well, it happens, right? And you go, dang it. So what do you do? 
you send it back to the lab and you have them at it, right? Or you say, ah, close enough. Well, with meal structure, you don't have to do it. Meal structure is pre-mixed. You just get a dab of this stuff. You put it on the interproximal area out of the mouth. You put it in an oven. You don't have to dry it. You don't have to, you do nothing to it. You just put it in, fire it, boom, it's done. I mean, anybody can do it. I'm proof because I can use it. So it, as far as changing contours and size of ledge length, say you want to change a contour ridge in an approximal contact, it's just really simple to do with Mio structure. So again, uh, these are just different examples. Here you see Mio pink right here. Here it is going here to here. So it's a structure material that has pink color in it. And we're just putting it on the zirconia to give it that little bit of texture and then it's fired and then off you go. So for on your all on force, um, it's just a great, great material to color your zirconia with. So I just wanted to pass that along because as far as anterior teeth go, this is just great stuff to have around. It handles very differently than stain. So if you decide to get some, you want some help with it, call me. I'll be happy to Zoom with you or to FaceTime with you to play with it. It's very, very different. That's all I can tell you. You don't paint it on like a conventional stain. You float it on a bed of wet solution. So it's very different. But it's actually, once you get the hang of it, it's a lot of fun to play with. So just keep that in mind for front teeth that it can really be a neat thing to help you. So uh, uh, that's really about it. I hope that this was helpful for you. Uh, this is the Mio stuff that, uh, this is how it comes. I have it labeled in terms of different opacities. We keep it in our little ceramic tray here, mixed and ready to go. You need a porcelain oven. By the way, at my course, Whitmix provides a porcelain oven for us, and they can also provide a great deal on one if you want one. Once again, I get zero kickback, but they, they help me in the course with it. So it's a good porcelain oven. It's one of them that I have here in my office. So uh, if you want a good deal on a porcelain oven, let me know that too. Um, here's the, the firing schedule on it. It's like I said, it's very low fusing. Happy to help you with any of this if, if, if you want to know how. So that about sums it up is what I want you to understand is that when we're dealing with front teeth, what you see is not always what you get. There's a perception of stuff for sure. And understanding those contour ridges and how that can affect what you're actually seeing can really be helpful. The other thing I would end with is this, that goodness gracious, somehow you've got to get great diagnostic wax ups, whether it's digital, whether you're doing it, or whether your technician's doing it. Um, it's your roadmap for everything you do.